Welcome to episode 148 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live October 22nd, 2019. This is a show about Office 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In this episode, Scott and I discuss a couple of recent self-service features in Office 365, one of them that's coming in the next month around the Power Platform, and another one that's already available around monitoring your own user logins. I'm auditioning for a role in the latest Microsoft musical, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a thing if you have not seen yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it was a little long, 10 minutes, but th- they were all very, very talented. That was a good one. I also especially like the newest one they have, Shadow IT meets Power BI or Power Platform. Power Platform meets Shadow IT? Meets Shadow IT. Yeah, something like that. It was an interesting announcement today. I did not see this coming. I don't think it was on the roadmap or anything. It just kind of like popped up today. And I actually saw it on the Twitters. I don't know if I have it in my message center or not. Yeah, I was looking through a couple of tenants that I have access to. And I have not seen it in those either. Here it is. It's in my message center from yesterday. Oh, it made it, huh? So if you want to look in your message center, it is MC193609. Announcing self-service purchase capabilities for Power Platform products. Yeah, this one sounds cool. (laughs) Yeah, so this is an interesting one. And I have seen, I think this is one people have two completely polar opposite reactions to. Because I saw another one of these, Phil's Twitter feed, which I didn't send you ahead of time, had like a big old argument going versus people that think this is a horribly bad idea and people that think this is the best idea ever. I'm pretty sure it depends on if you're an admin or if you're an end user and you don't have access to the admin stuff. Is going to split your reaction on this, maybe? Well, let's take a step back and explain what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's let people guess. Yes, so what are we talking about? Well, eh, MC, whatever, 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 zero. MC 193609. <laughs> it's 09, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on. It's six digits. You're supposed to be able to remember that. Uh, yeah. I think your max is seven, right? Or before you start forgetting. Well, you know, it's way harder than the combination of my luggage. That was just one, two, three, four, five. Nice and easy. Got me off Planet Spaceball. All set. I don't even want to know what your passwords are. <laughs> if you have your combination to luggage being that, your password is probably password. You've never seen Spaceballs? Come on. No, you know what? I don't think I have. Apparently I need to go watch it tonight. Oh no, Scott's going to... Yeah, no, that is... I just ended our friendship, I think. You got some work to do. You're going to take some heat. Everyone just send your emails to Ben, or you can find him on Twitter. Or maybe I can go watch it tonight before I take heat. (laughs) Anyways, back to... We are getting massively distracted. Everyone is always looking to save time in their day, just like moving to the cloud can save you from the mundane tasks of patching, updating, and maintaining servers. SaneBox can save you from the mundane and time-consuming task of managing your email. SaneBox works with your existing email configuration to make your mailbox awesome. It may be using Sane Black Hole to avoid mailing and cold sales emails or Sane Reminders to automatically remind you when you need to follow up on an email. You can even snooze an email. Yeah, just like that pesky alarm clock in the morning, to defer or to de-emphasize an email that doesn't need your immediate attention. So what are you waiting for? There's nothing to install, nothing to learn. Just go to sanebox.com slash all things. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash all things to get two weeks free and a $25 credit. Back to this announcement. What is it? Or do you want me to talk well, about it? I can talk about it since I have the message up. You know, actually, now that not I'm in here, I went into I, I found a tenant that has it. So maybe, maybe it's starting to filter into more and more of them, and they preemptively light it up because I could have swore it wasn't there this morning when I looked. But major update. You know, you get the little like chevron going across with the the writ. Oh, there it is. I see the exclamation point by yep. my message. Yep. Yep. Major, major update. Self service purchase capabilities for Power Platform products, including Power BI, Power Apps, and Flow, will be available for commercial cloud customers starting on November 19th. So less than a month. That's less than a month. <laughs> yeah, that's like 
28 days or something from when they announced this. That's all good, but uh, you think, oh, what could possibly be self-surface purchase capabilities? Well, if you've ever gone to something like flow.microsoft.com and you said, hey, I would like to buy this, and then it says, oh, this isn't available because you're not licensed for it, go talk to your IT admin, you know, you would have to go buy your favorite IT admin a cookie. Now you come over to this side and you look at it, and you'll actually be able to swipe your credit card and pick it up all outside of your existing relationship with Microsoft. You know, you might have like an enterprise agreement, something like that. Uh, doesn't really matter. You'll just be able to swipe your credit card and go. And you individually will be responsible for those licenses that you procure outside of your organizational licenses. Kind of cool, right? Right, because now this means that IT has no idea. You just upgraded to Flow Premium and are now randomly tweeting. Well, that's not a premium connector anymore, but connecting to Azure and you're doing all this stuff in Flow and Power Apps and Power BI that they have no idea about. (laughs) Yeah, I find this very interesting. So, I mean, it's clearly sitting inside of what would probably be considered, you know, enterprise tenancy. We've talked about these things, you know, like does having an e-plan make you an enterprise? No, it just might make you a really smart small business or individual or whatever it is. Clearly, it's kind of just out there for all commercial cloud tenants. So no like government community cloud, no GCC, no sovereign clouds, things like that. But it's very interesting the way it's worded, at least in the message center. And it seems to be confirmed by some of the follow-up from the folks at ZDNet or like Mary J. Foley, things like that, that as an admin, so let's say you are the global admin within your organization, or you're the billing admin, you're the one who's responsible for the procurement and assignment of licenses within your M365 or Office 365 tenancy, you're going to have a view of self-service purchases. So you'll certainly be able to see when people buy them, you'll be able to see how many licenses they've purchased and which users in your directory those licenses have been assigned access to. And that's kind of where it stops. There's nothing else in here that says, oh, if you're in an enterprise, you'll have a toggle and the ability to shut this off. Because <laughs> I could see this being like eminently useful functionality. You're, like, you're just getting started with Office right. 365. You are truly like, you are a business that's maybe not bound by regulatory things, compliance, or you're just getting started. And you know you click on that tile the first time and it says, oh, you're not licensed. Would you like to buy it? Yes, yes, I would. On the other side, if you're already in an established tenancy, this just feels like a Ooh, ooh, it 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 just feels like an idea that's going to hurt. <laughs> like you said, that's where my biggest thought came in is small business, okay, if you want to try to incorporate some type of chargeback model to departments cuz I can see maybe where they're going with this with Power Platform where they want to enable a chargeback, you put it on your corporate card or your corporate billing department, so it's kind of like a whole chargeback thing, but if you need to start worrying about HIPAA and PII and all of a sudden just random, it is, it's shadow IT, random people are lighting up these various capabilities in your tenant and you really have no idea about it or no control over it, it feels very dangerous. And they did say, like, there's a whole, the what do I need to prepare for this change? And underneath there at the very bottom, it essentially says the self-service purchase capability will arrive automatically, it's not configurable, there's no action you need to take, aka there's also no action you can take. (laughs) So in the next 20 days, go update all your training documentation as appropriate because you're going to get this whether you want it or not. Okay, so I added a little bit on the end there. But that's the gist of it. I can see why they would potentially want to do this. Their competitors certainly do this. Uh, Salesforce has self-service things within it. Even if you think about something like, hey, maybe use uh, something like Slack or Teams, things like that. You know, you can certainly go out and buy Dropbox on the side, like you know, Google Drive. There's all sorts of little things that you can go out and do, but you can do those things because they've always been that way. And this is one of those where it's like, 
Ooh, you know, to a certain degree, you might come to a company like Microsoft because they have those controls in place for you. There's a lot of like fuzzy room in here. Like, what do you do if the person in the organization, so somebody in finance said, oh, cool, I want to use this, uh, whatever connector with flow, you know, it pulls in currency prices or something like that. And, you know, they use it as part of Excel. So they go ahead and they say, "Oh, oh, I need to buy flow now. So they swipe their credit card, but they actually use their personal credit card. They don't use their corporate card. Well, now they're the ones who have the billing relationship with not micro, with Microsoft, not you, right? You can just see it. And I don't think they yep. would let you override it because that, that would be weird too. It also is, how to put this one, it just, it feels a little bit, uh, it feels a little bit not clean. <laughs> you know, it's like sticking your hand in the mud and having it come up and going like, eh, I, I don't know. Cause you could potentially be double billed for services. Like what if you're already on a plan that includes flow, but you've chosen not to license flow to your users. So now your users can just right. go and buy a flow license, even though you specifically turn that license off. Like, how does that work? And I wonder how they're going to address that. So the other one I'm curious about is because again, this goes back to self service. Is let's say we're working for the same company. You swipe your corporate credit card, purchase all these licenses for the sales department, and now you leave a year later, and your corporate credit card gets canceled or it expires and because it hit the expiration date and you're not getting a new one, how do you transfer this to somebody else when that credit card is no longer valid? (laughs) Because license transfer works so great today already. (laughs) Are you going to have the option to put in a new credit card and now this is something else to think about when your users leave is, oh, what self-service licenses have all my users bought that when Jane Doe leaves my company, I have to go put in a new credit card, but what if the next person doesn't want this and all the users are used to it? Like there's, there feels like a lot of implications here for it just to be on and not be a gradual rollout or have the ability to turn it off or on or again, some type of management. Okay, so maybe we do self-service where they can go request it and put in a credit card number for chargebacks, but it still has to route through some type of administrator or administrators have the rights to tie it to an EA. I don't, there feels like there should be a lot more controls around this before it just gets turned on. It just feels like there's going to be a lot of a lot of unnecessary spend. So there is that potential for kind of the double dip where you're already licensed for it, like I said, within your tenants, but you've chosen not to roll that out. So now your users go and buy it themselves. There's certainly the subscription aspect to it. Who owns the billing and, and what does that look like and what does carry forward look like? There's also insights into the workloads that are spun up. So if you and I are in the same tenant and I go buy flow and you go by power apps, are the admins in the org going to have the ability to kind of break through the wall? Like, are they still part of your tenant? Are they outside the tenant? Wasn't very clear based on that, how all that comes together. The tail end of well, as, as well, uh, you mentioned uh, enterprise agreements. So customers that are potentially on uh, EAs or transitioning to MCAs, things like that, you know, where you have an existing relationship with Microsoft, it's not always about the licensing that you've procured. It might also be access to side services. So something like support, you know, you might be a larger customer with premier support. What's going to happen here now that there's a separate building? relationship and a separate support relationship is support going to know that your corporate account already or your organization already has this wider thing how are they going to reach out to your kind of support organization and say hey do you want us to use your EA hours like what what should we be doing here to to work towards resolution on an issue things like that it's it's going to be yeah very very interesting it's the other one speaking of support we could keep going on this for a long <laughs> time is MSPs and CSPs. So, like if you're an MSP or a CSP and you're reselling Office 365, you'd set up the whole delegated admin, you're a cloud solution provider, you're essentially providing support. Not all MSPs or CSPs want to support the Power Platform because, let's face it, when you start getting into Power BI and all of that, that can kind of be its own separate niche. Is now if I'm a CSP, I've resold it to a customer, and a customer goes and does the self-service. 
are they going to still get routed to me for support? Because it actually changes all the support information in Office 365 in the portal where it updates email addresses, companies, phone numbers, all of that with your CSP instead of Microsoft is kind of that default open a support ticket experience. Am I, as a CSP or MSP or just supporting my clients, am I going to start all of a sudden getting phone calls and emails for support for Power Platform and I'm not in any position to support it? Or are they going to get routed differently based on where they go to open these support tickets and their self-service admin portal thing for Power BI versus the main admin portal? (laughs) There's a lot of questions here. (laughs) Just like one or two. I don't even know how the CSP relationship would work. You can't provision it. So you couldn't just go self-service it and buy it through the CSP because there's the whole API there. CSPs exist in the commercial cloud, so it's not very clear here <laughs> right. how this all comes together. I, m- I might have to go spin up like an Office 365 CSP subscription real quick. and You can buy one from me. I can sell myself one, thanks. <laughs> oh, okay. It'll be interesting. Or, here's your solution. Go switch to an education, government, or nonprofit tenant because this doesn't affect them. Ah, yes. That's, Problem solved. That's the way to do it. Government and education doesn't surprise me. Nonprofit does because I thought that was like the same skew, just different purchase channels. Apparently, that's its own tenant because nonprofit is all the same enterprise and business plans, just discounted prices, and you have to verify your nonprofit. But Based on this, apparently they can control features to nonprofit tenants too. Huh, who knew? New things we learn every, every day. Every day, always be learning. Yes. As IT professionals in the cloud era, sometimes it feels like we don't speak the same language as the rest of the organization. So when stakeholders from finance or other departments start asking about a specific project or team's Azure costs, they don't always realize how much work is involved in obtaining that information. Sifting through cluttered CSVs and a complex mass of metadata in order to manually create custom views and reports. It's a real headache. On top of helping you understand and reduce your organization's overall Azure spend, ShareGate Overcast lets you group resources into meaningful cost hubs and map them to real-world business scenarios. This way, you can track costs in the way that makes most sense with your corporate structure, whether it's by product, business unit, team, or otherwise. It's a flexible, intuitive, and business-friendly way of tracking Azure infrastructure costs, and it's only available in ShareGate Overcast. Find out more on sharegate.com slash IT pro. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention, you do have to be on the new admin center to view some of this stuff too. So there's a specific views to see your organizational licenses versus your self-service purchases and who those are assigned to, but that's only in the new admin center. So if you're not using the new admin center, You've got to go click the little try the new admin center to get toggled over to it. Frankly, I didn't realize there were still people using the old admin <laughs> center. It's been so long since I've seen the old one, I can't even remember what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, I didn't even know we had the ability to toggle back anymore. I've just lived in the new one. Yeah, but apparently there are still people on the old one. Hmm, imagine that. Yeah, so I don't know, have we beat that horse enough yet? The self-service is great when it is... Like 100% empowering. Yes. In this case, it seems from the outside, without having any of those governing controls in place, like, like I want a knob or a lever, right? I want something I can twist, turn, pull to go ahead and tweak this to where you want it to be within your tenant. And your tenant might be different than mine, and that's okay, right? We can all be special little snowflakes, but that's all well and good, but it's going to lead to some truly truly, truly adversarial moments within organizations. Like if you're in a bound organization with, you've already got like a risk management organization, auditors, things like that, fixed finance, it's going to be rough. (laughs) Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing that does bother me about it is not so much that they're testing out some of these self-service features, but that there's a lack of control around those if I need my environment to be controlled. One last thing before we get off. I think my other concern here is potential lack of clarity with consumers around things like cost. So if you think about how hard it is, and I'll kind of put you in the hot seat because you work with this stuff, like 
Office 365 licensing is not always as straightforward as you want it to be. So trying to rationalize cost in an OpEx world in the cloud, like how much does this flow feature actually cost me over the course of a year? Did I buy it for a year? Am I buying it month to month? Can I cancel early? When I cancel, what happens to my data? How does it like there's lots of little things in there too, which are going to have just like ongoing monetary real money upfront costs and just that lingering stuff that you can't get away from just based on this aspect of self-service at scale. From that licensing perspective, look at all the confusion we had within IT folks, people that were very familiar with Office 365 when they made that change to all the flow and power apps, pricing and licensing. Can you imagine business users trying to sort through that massive change that was made to licensing and feature scope and all of that. I mean, it was hard enough for IT people. I can't imagine if I had a whole bunch of business users that had self-service, gone through the whole self-service provisioning, created all these flow and power apps licenses within the Power BI or Power platform, and that change hit them, it would have been like mass chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens the next time licenses change? You're an organization with 2,000 people and a 1,000 of them have bought one-off licenses. (laughs) And you're getting charged month to month and you're not in an EA where you can renegotiate and all that. It's like, sorry, your credit card bill is going to like quadruple next month because you went and bought Flow and they took away all your Azure connectors. Sorry. I'm not bitter about that one at all. Yeah, I can can tell. (laughs) Yeah, I only use Azure automation with Flow a little bit. That's what you get for thinking you're, you're allowed to use things. And then I have them taken away. Oh, life yeah. in the cloud. I got one for you, just not to okay. you know, leave it as all like self-service is bad. Have you played around with the new My Sign-Ins portal yet? The new My Sign-Ins yeah. portal? Apparently, I missed some news. You did, so check this out. So go to okay. mysignins.microsoft.com. Mysignins.microsoft.com. Yep. Okay, it's loading. It's loading, it's loading, it's thinking about it. It's loading. This makes for good TV. Spinny, 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 recent... Activity. You should recognize each of these activities if one looks unfamiliar. Oh, nifty. Where did this come from? (laughs) This is one of those good user self-empowering feature that doesn't involve you spending any money or potentially going outside the bounds of your organizational governance. So one of the things that happens with Office 365 or M365, particularly in tenants that have things like premium licensing, maybe you're doing risk-based sign-in with something like conditional access, or if you've ever had maybe even a consumer account, like a Google account, like you have like a Gmail account or an Outlook account, and it says, hey, I don't recognize this sign-in, can you go ahead and give me more information? or check and say, yes, that was me. That same yep. functionality, that same consumer functionality is coming to Office 365 through the My Sign-Ins page. So there's going to be opportunities now where like, hey, I, I think my account's locked based on a risky sign-in, like I can't get into my tenant, but you'd be able to get to this page and say, nope, that was me. You know, I was actually in Amsterdam and then I was here in Atlanta and then I was back in Jacksonville. Like however it goes, you, you'll be able to go in and click the button and say that was you. And you'll have all the insight into the applications that are coming up as well. So maybe you're an organization that doesn't monitor like holistically, but individual users want to. They can go back and see things like successful and unsuccessful sign-in history and all that good kind of stuff. So anything that signs in through Office 365. Where is this? I have an unsuccessful (laughs) sign-in in my account. Well, So I do have one yesterday and it gives me... So, because people can't see this, it gives me yesterday at 2.46.32 p.m. an unsuccessful sign-in. It gives me the operating system, the browser, the approximate location, which I'm guessing is based on IP address because it only shows it for desktop sign-ins. It is. It's just a reverse IP. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't do it for mobile. And then it gives me the IP address I came from, the app. So this was trying to log into Office 365 Exchange Online. It gives me my account, which is my email address. And yeah, apparently I tried to sign in from Germany yesterday afternoon at 2.46 p.m. It might not have been you trying to sign in. That's kind of what I'm gathering. (laughs) This is nifty because it does tell you mobile device, the account. I sign in a lot. There's a lot of re-authentication happening. There is. You'll probably see a lot, a lot of teams in there. If you sign into the Azure portal, you will see a lot of the Azure portal, and you will probably see clients like Outlook quite a bit as well. Outlook 
mobile. So I don't see my desktop Outlook so much, but a lot of Outlook mobile. Like my mobile device has signed in like eight times already this morning. Yeah. It's just kind of one of those like cool little things, right? You can go in and view yourself as a user and then you can go ahead and see see your sign ins. Yeah. And it does give you a little map there too. Although the map for me isn't very helpful. It doesn't even show the whole name of the city in some cases, if your city name is really long. But it does give you kind of a little quick snapshot of yeah, this is the right city or not the right city. <laughs> Close counts. That that's just it's hard to look at, but you should at least get a sense. Like you, you were able to identify a geography and say, "Hey, Germany," or you know, I saw this thing coming in from Nigeria, or maybe some place in Asia Pacific or Russia, or wh- whatever it happens to be. China. You know, you, you'll have the ability to potentially self monitor and self flag. Put those things where they need to be. Yeah, way to call out that Nigerian prince that keeps emailing. I know, but you're going to be rich someday. It's okay. I am. I keep sending him money and I keep waiting for it to come back. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Hasn't happened yet. This is really cool. Everyone on your team is unique. So is skillmeup.com. Only SkillMeUp provides the bridge from fundamentals to certification paths to advance skills to accelerate digital transformation with one subscription and five ways to learn. Start your free pilot today and supercharge your IT and Microsoft Azure skills by visiting skillmeup.com slash pilot or click the link in the show notes below. I hope they keep going with this because it would be really cool now to be able to actually sort and filter to see like all these sign-ins that were me that maybe weren't from the US or were from a certain operating system or a certain IP address. So they do have some plans for this. The kind of future thing they called out on the roadmap for this particular one was adding those buttons for things like this was me or this wasn't me and being able to get in that way. And then if you're licensed for identity protection with within your Azure AD tenant and those licenses are available, you'll also potentially see those things that might be considered a regular login, but they're eh, kind of slightly weird or unusual. You'll see those bubble up to the top as well as they're driven through that kind of ML funnel or you know taking all those authentications across the entire platform and surfacing them up for for all of us along the way. Yeah, you know what would be another cool feature is to have a little button here that's like report to admin that sends just a little alert to your Office 365 admins of a suspicious login so they could actually investigate it. I've got all kinds of ideas. I should go work on the product. <laughs> Yeah, go for it. You know, they always have openings or they have openings quite a bit, but got to move to Redmond. Yeah, I don't know that I can get my wife to move to Redmond. Huh. Nice new features. Mm -hmm. Any other new features that have come out? I've been so busy. I have not kept up as much as I should. Uh, Yeah, no, that that was probably like neatest one that I noticed recently. You know, there's there's always stuff kind of. Yeah, it's probably going to slow down a little bit, right? With Ignite coming, I'm guessing there's some stuff that's being held back. Yeah, I think post-Ignite, you'll see a lot of things kind of really light up and and come out the door. And most of it won't be, I think, too surprising depending on where you sit because you'll have seen a a lot of it coming. So some of these kind of sweeping changes, you know, get these out of the way first so that you have a nice kind of launch point at Ignite to keep going through, at least through into the new year. Yep, It'll be fun. I think we'll have all sorts of things to talk about coming tonight. Now that we have pretty much covered our topics, do you want a website to go waste time on? And that's kind of interesting if anybody's still listening. <laughs> I just found out about this website. Yeah? I am curious to see if you've heard of it. Okay. Have you ever been to govdeals.com? To govdeals.com. G-O-V-D-E-A-L-S. What am I buying? Can I buy like... Repurpose like Hummers. A liquidity service marketplace that is tied to government agencies so they can sell surplus assets via the internet. I have seen things like this. There's also, uh, I'll have to see if I can dig them up. I have them someplace in, you know, like Pinboard or something like that, where there's sites that do bulk consolidation for computers as well. So maybe you're like an enterprise buyer and, and you go ahead and say, okay, we need to have all our PCs go for reclamation. So they'll shred the hard drives, but then you're left with all the laptops and things like that. Think like, you know, like, hey, you had to swap out a thousand X1 carbons. Well, they're still perfectly good computers, right? It's not that they're bad. It's just that they, they're missing their NVMe drives, but you can go buy those by the pallet as well. There's some fun stuff out there. That's what you can do. You can buy like a pallet of IMAX, but 
that's kind of fun because it's not just computers. Like if you want to, there's a section for cranes. You can go buy a container crane. Yes. That's in Tacoma, Washington for $25,000 because you always wanted a container crane. I've always wanted one of those. Yeah. Woodworking equipment, cafeteria, kitchen equipment. It's, you can start looking at some of the vehicles too. Like if you ever wanted to buy like a Department of Transportation type snowplow or garbage truck, dump truck, some of those pop up on here. Fire engines. I think I saw a category for fire and police equipment. Yeah. F- fire trucks. Fire trucks. 51 items. You want to buy a fire truck? Only $100,000. I'm out. Oh, you're looking at the expensive one. There's some on here for like 22000 Here's a 1991 100 foot aerial platform, like the big old hook and ladder aerial platform truck. $22,500. Huh. I kind of want this 1988 International R500 ARFF vehicle. $3,000. No title restrictions in place. Clean bill of health. Navistar diesel engine. Yeah, let's do it. Here's one up in Anchorage. Yeah. Is that the one you... Oh yeah, that's the one you were just looking at. It's green. It looks like a transformer. Yeah. So if you're still listening, there is absolutely no technical benefit coming unless you want to hear us ramble about what we found on GovDeals. <laughs> <laughs> There's all sorts of things like this. You do uh, gsaauctions.com, liquidation.com does warehouse deals. You can actually go to Amazon and you can buy bulk pallets of Amazon returns if you want to. They'll kind of give you a sense of potentially what's on the pallet and you can kind of take a mess, take a chance on it. Lots of people buy those for, you know, YouTube videos for like shock value and things like that for, you know, just, hey, look at me spend a thousand dollars on a pallet and see what I get out of it. Got it. There's a category in here for tanks. I was hoping it was like actual tanks, but it's like water tanks and gas tanks. It's not military tanks. Boring. I know. I want a tank to park in my driveway. I'm sure the HOA would have absolutely no problem with me parking a tank in my driveway. Uh, Mine would. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So anyways, with that, I have nothing else for our day's episode. Glad we could spend like a million minutes ranting about (laughs) ranty stuff. We won't rant next time. We'll try to talk about something non-ranty next time. It'll be getting close to Ignite next time. We're getting close to Ignite, so hopefully there'll be some uh, some newer stuff coming. Like as yeah, they again kind of lot. continue to clear the rug and make sure it's all good and ready to go. Yep, probably some newsy episodes coming up. Maybe a few interviews. Did you see? I won't talk about it too much. Did you see some of the interviews? That list of people that if we want to schedule an interview with them, we can do that. Yeah. I think I did. That would be kind of interesting. We'll have to talk about that, see if we want to do something like that. But hopefully we'll have some good stuff coming out of Ignite over the next month or so. Sounds like a plan. Go get some work done or do your best. I'll try my best. Thanks, Ben. Yep, we'll talk to you later, Scott. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.